Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami So we're getting close to the end of the happiness chapter in Buddha Dhamma and still a month left to go in the retreat. So I thought I would read more from Ajahn Sumedho, talks to the monastic community at Wapananachat in May 1989. And this talk is called, We Can't Attain It, We Realize It, is given on May 16th. I have to say this is something I missed from the early days at Abayagiri, having readings, there was readings almost every day usually biographies of Kuruba Ajans or great practitioners. Sometimes Lungparpasano, sometimes Ajanamaro would give readings. It's something about being read to and being able to sit and listen to it, I, I greatly appreciate. So Lungpur Sumedho, and then, that'll, then I will have read nearly everything from this booklet. <clears throat> In Buddhist meditation, we distinguish between samatha and vipassana, and these are both important to develop. Samatha is to learn how to concentrate the mind on an object like the breath or whatever sign we are using. Now that has to be developed to where we contain the mind and keep it from wandering. We sustain and hold our attention on the object we have chosen It's a mental exercise that gives the mind a kind of sharpness. But as an end in itself, it cannot enlighten us. We can't be enlightened through just concentrating our mind, even to a very refined level, like the arupa jhanas, the formless states of absorption. The insight into the true nature of things is not possible until we start reflecting and looking into examining and investigating the way things are. Samatha is actually a very simple practice. We tend to complicate it by analyzing and thinking about it. And then, of course, it becomes an impossibility. It's merely that ability to choose an object and hold our attention there, a way of training the mind. Most of our minds have not been trained in that way before we became Buddhist monks. We're, far, we're from a society that uses discursive and associative thoughts. Our minds are conditioned to think in rational ways. This sharpens our critical faculties, but also our ability to doubt increases. The more we think about life, the more we experience doubt, uncertainty, and anxiety. Our critical faculties are definitely sharpened through modern attitudes like competition. We're always busy comparing. This is better than that. This is good. That is bad. Bad, worse, worst. Good, better, best. Samatha is often easier for people who are even illiterate, their critical faculties not highly developed yet. The mind tends not to wander or doubt so much. People with a lot of confidence, faith, and conviction find it much easier than those being caught in anxiety, insecurity, worry, and despair, which is very much the result of a self created out of desires and fear. We tend to introspect and analyze ourselves. We evaluate and criticize. These kinds of mental habits make concentration increasingly difficult. Here in Thailand, the Thai monks already have a tremendous amount of faith in and devotion to the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. They have a foundation of trust and confidence, of sadha. This is not so common to find amongst the Westerners, because most of us come to Buddhism out of intellectual interest. Sometimes we can appreciate it on that level, but our hearts are completely cold. We can be quite impressed by the brilliance of the teaching, and still not feel very much devotion and gratitude, or any of these more heartfelt qualities, which are definitely helpful and supportive in practicing samatha meditation. Conditions around us are also important. 
We can't very well do samatha in a place where there is a lot of sensory impingement and demands. The less there is impinging on us, the easier it is to concentrate our minds. We could go off to a sensory deprivation tank, a cave or some isolated place where we could not stay and not have where we could stay and not have demands and expectations placed on us, where there are no harsh, aggravating and annoying impingements. We can get quite naturally calm with no sounds and nothing to look at. After the initial restlessness and resistance, we go into a concentrated state of mind quite naturally. Vipassana, then, is where we use wisdom. The surrounding conditions are not the important issue anymore. We're looking into the nature of things without seeking ideal conditions for that, but just observing the way things are. We use the three characteristics of anicca, dukkha, anatta, the four foundations of mindfulness, the paticca samuppada. All these different teachings are part of vipassana. They are ways of contemplating, reflecting and observing the way things are. The five khandhas, for example. How do we use that particular sequence? Those five concepts of rupa, vedana, sanya, sankhara, vijnana are conventions in themselves and not to be considered from a from a doctrinal position. There are perceptions to use and to work with. What is being conscious anyway? Even though we're conscious, we may not investigate consciousness. Obviously, everyone here is conscious, but how many of us really know what that is? What is the difference between perception, volition, and feeling? These are just ways of examining and looking at the way things are. All of us have the five khandhas. So this is something we can examine and investigate. Let's say we investigate the eye and the object. We really examine that in a practical way, looking at something with our own eyes, and then the eye consciousness arises through the contact with the objects. The same with sound, smell, taste, touch, or thought. All of this we can observe and, and investigate. Even though there is sound going on all the time, we're not always conscious of it, are we? When we're looking at something, we're conscious through the eye, but we're not conscious through the ear. Consciousness can move very rapidly. So it seems we can be conscious through all the senses at the same moment. If we examine it more carefully, we begin to see that whatever we're looking at, at that time we're no longer conscious of a sound. When we're eating food, notice the consciousness of taste. We can be thinking about something while we're eating and not be aware of eating. How many of us really taste our food? We often are in a rush or talking or busy in some other way while eating. We like to have snacks every now and then while reading or watching the television. There is an initial state. There is an in initial taste of something and then we tend to just eat out of habit. We might be thinking, watching, or listening, and so no longer aware of tasting. When the eye is concentrated on an object of sight, we're no longer conscious through the body. Hot and cold, pleasure and pain don't exist at that time. So in dealing with physical sensation, we can distract ourselves by looking or listening or turning to something else to get away maybe from physical discomfort. That's one way of dealing with it. Another way is the investigation of physical pain, where we go right to the actual sensation of pain, looking into the pain itself, getting to know the difference between the sensation and the aversion that we mentally develop around a sensation. For example, we have the pain in our legs. If we go to the actual sensation and concentrate our attention on it, we stop thinking about it. We're with the sensation but we're not creating mental aversion to its seemingly unpleasant appearance. Generally, we are not that refined and aware. We tend to just be averse to physical pain and discomfort and try to suppress it, or we use willpower to endure it. When we go to the sensation itself, then there is body consciousness. We're not adding aversion onto the pain. I can't stand it. I don't want it. These are emotional reactions to physical discomfort and pain of any sort. 
This is to be investigated and observed. When we are bringing attention to the sensations of the body, whether it's pleasant, painful, or neutral, more and more the body will relax. When we feel tension or stress, if we concentrate right on that spot with an attitude of just bare attention, without aversion to it, then the condition for pain can diminish. What we can't stand, really, is the emotional reaction. Most pain we can bear. It's when we think, I can't stand any more of this, that we give up and try to get away from it. If we're caught in that emotional realm of, I can't bear it, then we can even be thinking that before there is any actual pain. What if pain arises? I won't be able to stand it. We can already be suffering by the possibilities of experiencing pain we don't yet have. Because, our abil because of our ability to remember pain we've had before and couldn't stand. So we investigate just how the mind works, the way things are. If our body is giving us pain, that's the way it is. It's not something we've created. We're not deliberately, intentionally trying to make pain arise in our body. But the reaction out of ignorance, desire, and fear is having aversion, wanting not to have or to get rid of. Notice how lust and sexual desire make us kind of dull and we lose our ability to discriminate. We can get caught in lustful fantasies, seeking sensual pleasures with mind and body and lose our sense of perspective. We become so eager to get what we want and to experience the pleasure that we anticipate that our ability to discriminate becomes inoperative. Aversion and anger tend to make us very critical. Lust does just the opposite. The idea is to get what we are craving for. That is the sole aim and purpose. We can lose our sense of propriety and integrity and a lot of virtuous qualities when we get caught in that lustful tendency of the mind. Now don't believe me, but watch, examine, and investigate how these things affect us because we all experience these conditions. <clears throat> in Thailand, I remember, there were hardly any sweets or sweet drinks at Wat Bapong. So whenever there was the possibility of anything sweet, we would become obsessed with the idea. One time someone gave me a bag of sugar. I took it back to my kuti and took a taste of it. Then suddenly that taste of sweetness created such greed in my mind that I consumed the whole bag of sugar in, a, in very few minutes, completely out of control, which is surprising because I wasn't into sweets very much as a layperson. I would have thought it was disgusting to eat a whole bag of sugar in five minutes. But the conditions were supportive. <laughs> the fact that I was alone, nobody was watching, and no one would know. Also, sweetness is a very attractive taste for us, especially if we're eating one meal a day and we're celibate. Usually for a layperson, greed is spread out, scattered over quite a range of things, so we don't notice so much. Thought doesn't collect on anything as simple and ridiculous as a bag of sugar. But in the homeless life, we might find ourselves lusting after a bag of sugar, which we should not have been interested in, in at all as laypeople. Who would ever eat just sugar granules if one can get pralines and fudge and all kinds of much more pleasurable sweets to indulge in? But one thing that this allowed me to see and contemplate was the sweet taste of sugar, and that, cre and that creates in the mind the desire for more. One spoon, we taste it, and then we want more. If we follow that impulse and get caught in that desire for more, then we start satiating ourselves until we have had so much we can't handle anymore. That's what lust and greed are like, an experience we ha all have as human beings. Now with mindfulness, then we can taste sweetness and be aware of its pleasant qualities. Through investigation and understanding, we no longer create lust around it. It's as it is. We're not following, seeking to have it again and again and again until we're absolutely satiated. Mindfulness allows us to know and be aware of time and place, appropriateness and suitability. It allows us to have integrity, to be considerate and thoughtful in our lives. 
the generation of Americans that I was brought up that I was brought up in never admitted that they were afraid of anything. To be a man, one had to put on this act, what they call macho, strutting around, wanting to give that impression of fearlessness. So fear sometimes is not recognized. Strangely enough, some of the most aggressive types of men are often the most frightened. In meditation, these masculine and aggressive types of men have to deal with tremendous fear and terror. Now there is a natural fear that arises, like the instinctual fear of a tiger that's chasing us. That's a protective device in nature. It's not personal and it's not a, f it's not a fault. It doesn't make us heedless. That kind of instinctual fear when we see a tiger that looks like he's ready to attack us makes us act very swiftly in order to protect our life. Then there is also the kind of fear that things that, of things that haven't yet occurred of possibilities in the future. All the anxieties and worries we create in our lives about the possibility of being hurt or damaged, ostracized or humiliated and insulted, of being deprived and without what we want. There's the fear of the unknown. We can look into the black night and become frightened because our eyes can't see in the darkness of the night. Or being in a closed room with no light, anything could be there. Our sense of security, of knowing isn't present. We could imagine ghosts, monsters, or there might be scorpions, tarantulas, or cro cobras. In this country, it's quite possible to go into a room where there is a cobra that we can't see. When we turn the lights on, we can look around and know that in this room, there isn't anything dangerous. There's a lot to be afraid of in this life as human beings. Things can happen to us that we know are quite possible. We can be hit by a car or be attacked by somebody. Think of what kind of fear and anxiety women have to bear with of being an attractive force to men. They have to be careful not to put themselves in positions where they can be sexually attacked. It's a possibility of which they're very much aware of. These are natural kinds of fears and anxieties that our human condition gives us. Being born in this state, then this is the way it is. But then fear becomes neurotic and obsessive and unreasonable. We can be driven by fear that we've never really looked at. We're just suppressing or repressing it out of consciousness. We can be concerned about what people think of us. We're the kind of creature that cares about what other people think about us. We can be anxious and worried that others don't like us or don't want us. We can become quite obsessed reading this into every situation. Fear of being unwanted or despised or looked down on. Anxiety, worry, and doubt, all these imply dealing with unknown things. Instinctive fears deal with the known, with a definite situation. But because we think and imagine, we create a self, a personality, a person. So this person can always be hurt or insulted or offended in some way or another. It's so fragile, isn't it? We worry about the future and we feel guilty about the past. We're anxious about some situation we're in, that something might go wrong, that something bad might happen. Note this state of mind. Uncertainty, insecurity, and worry are so ordinary to our daily life experience, and yet we do not understand and merely try to get rid of these. How can I get rid of my worries? What I found helpful is to really notice and to be aware of what it's like to not know, to be uncertain about things, to be in a state of doubt, investigating not knowing, rather than always trying to know or to dismiss our uncertainty or, and insecurity. What does it feel like to be worried and uncertain? We look at these different mind states of unknown possibilities. The desire to know and to have security is very strong to feel that we're practicing in the right way. This is really the best monastery in the whole world. This is definitely our path. It's the right religion, the right philosophy and psychology. Yes, we're definitely doing the right thing. Maybe we want somebody to affirm that what we're doing is right, to have affirmation from teachers or other monks or people around us, to be told, yes, you're on the right path. Yes, this is the perfect place. What happens if somebody comes here and says, oh, this monastery isn't very good. You should go somewhere else and take somebody's retreat. 
then what does our mind do? If we're not really investigating the way things are, then we get caught up in doubt and uncertainty about what we're doing. Then we go to one of the senior monks and say, is this the right way? And I say, yes, it is. This is the right place for you. Oh, thank goodness. Somebody said it wasn't, so I was a bit worried that maybe I was in the wrong place. <laughs> like fundamentalist Christianity, everything is affirmed over and over again. If one goes to a born-again Christian meeting, it's a continuous affirmation of, this is the only way, Jesus is our savior, this is right, all the others are wrong, it's the only way. Do the Buddhists? No, no, they're totally wrong. It's wrong, wrong. Jesus didn't teach Buddhism, he taught Christianity. What about Roman Catholics? No, no, popery and all that. Endless, <laughs> endless prejudices, except for one particular form of fundamentalist Christianity, which is the only way. So I might say, Venerable Sir, please give me a testimonial about your experience with this particular religion and how the Lord came and saved you. The Venerable Sir gets up and says, I used to be a sinner and drink liquor. Then I discovered Jesus and now I'm saved. My whole life has changed. I used to be an alcoholic and gamble and be totally immoral. Now I've given it all up. Everybody's weeping and crying and everybody is affirming. Praise the Lord. In Buddhism, we're looking at doubt rather than trying to convince ourselves that Buddhism is the right way. We want to investigate and look into the nature of things. It's not a matter of trying to tell everyone this is the best way. Buddhism is the only way, that's for certain. In Vipassana, we're looking at the way things are. So when there's doubt, we investigate what it is to be wobbly, anxious, and worried. Real confidence comes with stream entry, the first stage of awakening. It's when we're not affirming the Eightfold Path as a belief, but we're actually getting through the doubt by understanding its nature. To enter the stream, we have to really know Sakaya Ditti, Sila Bhatta Bharamasa, and Vichikicha. That's personality view, attachment to practices and conventions, and doubt. Those three fetters, they're not to be rejected, but to be investigated. Oftentimes, we just want aff affirmation, like, am I a stream enterer yet, Ajahn Sumedho? People love to speculate about who's a stream enterer or who's an arahant. But it's not a matter of somebody becoming a stream enterer, but of recognizing those fetters for what they are and no longer being deluded by them. Because as long as we are caught in doubt and uncertainty and keep following it, we're definitely not going to see the path, the way out of suffering. To get affirmation isn't the way out of suffering either, because it always needs to be reinforced. People have to agree with us. Yes, this is the way. Yes, you have attained. Yes, yes, yes. All the great Ajans have agreed that I am a full-fledged stream enter. I have a certificate. Here, see? It has the signature of important bhikkhus on it. There's a seal and even the Sangharaja signed it. <laughs> this is being preposterous, of course. It's not affirmation that we are anything, but recognizing the nature of doubt and the attachment to self-view and to conventions. Now what is more preposterous than wanting to become a... Now what is more preposterous than want to, wanting to become a sotapanna? If we ask, am I a sotapanna yet? There's still doubt in our mind, isn't there? That's vichikicha. Or if we say, I am a sotapanna. That's self-view, sakaya ditti. So we investigate, I am, I should be, I am not, am I, have I? This way of thinking. The value of teachings like sotapanna, anagami, arahant, is that they're not attainments, but used as reflections. Then more and more, relinquishment and letting go can take place, rather than achieving or attaining something. We can't attain it. We realize it through letting go and understanding the nature of things. On the personal level, we want to attain it. Once we appreciate these teachings as ways for reflecting on attachments, there is no need to hold on to a view of having to become something or having not become anything. We can equally hold the view that we haven't attained anything, even though we might have been a monk for all those years. Or being super modest, oh, I couldn't possibly, little old me, dare to assume I've entered the stream? Someone might condemn me as being Uttarimanusa Dhamma Parajika. 
So we use our reflective capacity instead of judging that there are certain things we have to get rid of in order to become a stream enterer. We investigate Vinaya and tradition. Now, some people take the idea of not being attached to the opposite extreme and say we shouldn't have rules and tradition. Ceremonies and celibacy, it's all rubbish. One just gets attached to it and one shouldn't be attached to anything. That kind of thinking is still Sakaya Ditti, isn't it? Other people really hang on to Vinaya and tradition, trying to protect it by all means in order to make sure that everything is going to be all right. We have to get rid of, kill, annihilate, and burn at the stake any blasphemers or heretics that threaten the purity of our tradition. Got to keep my Vinaya pure, and if some woman comes along and touches me, dares to touch me, am I pure or not? How do I know I didn't set myself up? Maybe latent sexual tendencies are there lurking and I'm placing myself in a position very convenient for a woman to come along and touch me, then I'll have an offense. We can make the whole Vinaya structure incredibly burdensome through foolish and blind attachment to it and strange views about purity and impurity rather than using Vinaya for restraint and as a way of reflecting. Limits we can use as standards to work from. I remember I spent a vasa wat kao chalak. The vinaya there is very strict and the monks are quite obsessed about it. I thought, I'm from Wat Papong, we have good vinaya. And so I announced myself. They said, oh yes, the Wat Papong vinaya is not so good. Ours is much better. So I got intimidated. Their vinaya is better than ours. I want to keep the best vinaya and I got really interested. Then I went to a small island where one of these monks was living as a kind of hermit. I stayed with him for a while and then left. Later he told the other monks that I didn't have a very good understanding of Vinaya. When I heard that, I was really angry. I was ready to go right back to that island and punch him in the nose. I thought my Vinaya was really good and then he said it wasn't. That's an insult to me. But that's also Sakaya Ditti. Is that a skillful use of Vinaya? This kind of comparing, my Vinaya is better than yours. How dare you accuse me of not keeping good Vinaya? It's not because Vinaya is the problem. The danger lies with Sakaya Ditti, Silabhata Baramasa, and Vichikicha. I talk about my own experiences so others don't have to be ashamed about having foolish thoughts and attachments. As long as we are willing to learn from them and see them clearly rather than to suppress or believe them. Another aspect to reflect on is the two sects of Dhammayut and Mahanikai. If we go to a Dhammayut forest temple, thinking we're very strict and pure, not touching money, practicing like good Kamatana forest monks, they look at us suspiciously once they find out we're Mahanikai. They put us at the end of the line and treat us like we're not really proper monks sometimes. In such situation, we might see Sakaya Ditti arising, how dare they, kind of self-views. To me, it seems much better to watch that than to make much of it and be carried away by indignation because we're treated in a way we think we shouldn't be treated. When we're practicing Dhamma, we're taking life as it is. We're not trying to make everything fair and just, straighten out the world and make everything as it should be. We're willing to use life's unfairness and each experience for practicing Dhamma to recognize the way things are. If we feel angry for being looked down on and regarded as something inferior, not as good, but we think we are quite as good or even better, then that's an opportunity to see Sakaya Ditti. We investigate and learn to use life's experiences wisely. So that's not quite the end of the talk, but uh, we're out of time. If anybody has a brief question or comment, I just always really appreciate Lumpur Sumedho's candor and talking about his, his own practice in that way. And, and, uh, I just think it's quite wonderful.